All right, so 50 high yield MSK questions, tons of mnemonics mixed in there to help you on your exams, just focusing in on the high yield stuff that you need to know for your exams. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for the support. I recently hit 10,000 subscribers, which is just incredible. Um, so thank you so much for the support, the really nice comments, everything. I really do appreciate it. Question one, a 42 year old female presents to the office today complaining of a burning pain in the ball of her foot radiating to the third and fourth toe. She states the burning sensation is worse after a long day of standing on her feet, especially when she wears high heels. Physical examination reveals tenderness in the plantar aspect of the distal foot over the third intermetatarsal space. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be a Morton neuroma. So Morton neuroma, which is a compressive neuropathy. When it comes to Morton neuroma, there's three things that you need to know for the exam. That will be in the vignette for sure. It will be a woman. They will likely describe a tight fitting shoe, often high heels as overpronation of the foot can cause this condition. And the paresthesia, numbness, burning, et cetera, that the patients feel is going to be most common in the third intermetatarsal space. The way that I used to remember these key, three uh, key things in the vignette is by focusing in on the M in Morton's neuroma. If you turn the M on its side, it's a three. That helps you remember the third intermetatarsal space is the most common area to be affected. If you turn the M upside down, it's a W. That helps you remember women are approximately five times more likely than males to develop Morton neuroma. And then the M also looks like the spike of two heels, at least it does to me, and that helps you remember that this will often be caused from tight-fitting shoes or high heels from the overpronation of the foot. So remember for Morton's neuroma, third intermetatarsal space, way more common in women, and M upside down, tight-fitting shoes like high heels. A 63-year-old female presents to the office to review the results of her bone density test. She has a history of vertebral fractures and her recent bone density test reveals a T-score of negative 2.8. The treating physician decides to start the patient on relax. What is, the, what is likely positive in this patient's past medical history that would influence the decision to start her on raloxifene rather than an alternative osteoporosis agent? So that is going to be breast cancer. So raloxifene is a selective re estrogen receptor modulator. And while it does not work as well as bisphosphonates, the unique thing about this drug is that in addition to treating osteoporosis, it also reduces the risk of breast cancer. So it's usually reserved for osteoporosis patients when there's also a need for breast cancer prophylaxis. That's really the only thing to know for this med. So how can you remember that? Well, there's a much more commonly used med for breast cancer prophylaxis slash treatment that you've probably heard of that's in the same class, and that's tamoxifen. Tamoxifen, raloxifen sounds very similar. So remember, raloxifen is in the same class as tamoxifen, and in addition to treating osteoporosis, it can also be used as breast cancer prophylaxis. 42-year-old female presents to the office complaining of heartburn, small white lumps on her fingers, as well as a tight feeling in her hands that makes it difficult to make a fist. On physical exam, you note telangiectasias on the palms and face. Labs are positive for both anti-nuclear antibodies as well as anti-centromere antibodies. What diagnosis should be suspected in this patient? So that is going to be limited systemic sclerosis, AKA Crest syndrome. So this patient has a very classic presentation and has a number of the manifestations of Crest syndrome. Remember, Crest stands for calcinosis cutis, Raynaud phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. So we see the calcinosis cutis. Those are those small white calcium deposits in her hands. <clears throat> she has heartburn, which is from the esophageal dysmotility disorder, telangiectasias, as well as the tightening of the skin of the hands, which can progress to sclerodactyly, where we have this claw-like appearance of the hands. This is classic limited systemic sclerosis, aka Crest syndrome, which we know will generally have a positive ANA, and most importantly, a positive anti-centromere antibody test, which I used to remember as anti-crestomere instead to help remember this antibody is positive in Crest syndrome. So if you see a positive anti-centromere, instead think of anti-crestomere and think of Crest syndrome, which is associated with limited systemic sclerosis. A 63-year-old female presents to her physician's office complaining of pain and stiffness in her shoulders, hip, and neck. She states the symptoms are very severe in the morning, sometimes limiting her activity, and as the day goes on, there is moderate improvement. Physical exam reveals normal muscle strength and slightly reduced range of movement. Labs reveal elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. Serum rheumatoid factor as well as creatine kinase are normal. The patient is diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica and started on corticosteroids. A clinical assessment <clears throat> for the presence of what other associated condition should be considered in this patient. So that is going to be giant cell arteritis. So remember, giant cell arteritis is associated with polymyalgia rheumatica. You have to know that anywhere from 5 to 30% of patients with PMR will 
um, have giant cell arteritis. This always shows up on exam questions and if and you don't want to miss this diagnosis in real life because it can lead to blindness if not treated. So if you make the diagnosis of PMR in a patient, make sure you're asking the patient about headaches, jaw claudication, transient vision loss to make sure they don't need a workup for giant cell. So the way that I used to remember that polymyalgia rheumatica is associated with giant cell arteritis is by instead of remembering it as Paul E. Myalgia rheumatica, instead remember it as Paul B. Myalgia rheumatica. Paul B. as in Paul Bunyan the Giant from those kids' books. And you'll always remember that this is associated with giant cell arteritis. What is the most common type of osteoporotic fracture? <clears throat> that is going to be vertebral fractures. So vertebral compression fractures are the most common type of osteoporotic fracture. These type of fractures can sometimes be asymptomatic. So remember to assess for loss of height or kyphosis as these, as these are sometimes the only indicator of a vertebral compression fracture in an osteoporotic patient. A 62-year-old male presents to the emergency department after being involved in a motor vehicle accident. He's complaining of severe pain in his right hip. On physical exam, you note the right leg is internally rotated and adducted. X-rays reveal a dislocation of the right hip. What type of dislocation did this patient likely suffer? So that is going to be a posterior hip dislocation. So why a posterior uh, hip dislocation? First, posterior hip dislocations are the most common type of hip dislocation, accounting for almost 90% of all hip dislocations. And then the second reason why this is likely a posterior dislocation is because on the patient's physical exam, the patient's leg is internally rotated and adducted, which is the classic presentation for posterior dislocations, where anterior are classically externally rotated and abducted. A 46-year-old male presents to the office complaining of severe lower back pain radiating into both legs, as well as numbness in his inner thighs and buttocks that started after moving some furniture. He also reports difficulty with urination. Physical exam reveals lower extremity weakness, saddle paresthesia, and loss of rectal tone. What is the diagnostic test of choice for the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be an MRI. This patient very likely has cauda equina syndrome. They have the classic clinical manifestations, lower back pain radiating into the legs, saddle paresthesia, urinary incontinence, loss of rectal tone. All of these areas are affected because cauda equina syndrome is a severe compression of multiple lumbosacral nerve roots that innervate these regions. So when cauda equina syndrome is suspected, you're going to order an MRI. Generally with contrast, this is your diagnostic test of choice. And really in any situation where there's suspicion for a localized process within the spinal cord, MRI is gonna be your diagnostic test of choice. Anterior displacement or forward slippage of one vertebral body with respect to the one beneath it is known as, and that is spondylolisthesis. So forward slipping of a vertebral body relative to an adjacent inferior vertebral body, that's spondylolisthesis. Uh, 30 to 50% of the time, this is a consequent of spondylolysis. Anyways, how do you remember spondylolisthesis is forward slippage of a vertebral body? Well, I have a little trick that worked for me when I saw spondylolisthesis. At the end of the word, it has list thesis in it, um, like your thesis statement. So when I see spondylolisthesis, I think of the sentence, list your thesis statement on this slip of paper and pass it forward. Like you're in class and your teacher asks you to pass your thesis statement forward. So when you see spondylolisthesis, right away think list thesis. And then what are you gonna do with your thesis? You're going to list it on a slip of paper and pass it forward. And that slip of paper being passed forward helps remember the vertebral body slips forward in spondylolisthesis. A little weird, but it definitely worked for me. A 32-year-old female presents to the office complaining of fatigue, weakness, fever, and a rash for the past two months. On physical exam, you note erythema over the cheeks and nose, sparing the nasolabial folds. You suspect lupus and order an anti-nuclear antibody, which comes back positive. Which additional lab test listed below would be most appropriate to order next to assist in making the diagnosis? So A, anti-centromere antibody. B, anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody, C, anti-Smith antibody, or D, anti-cyclic sutrilinated uh, peptide antibody. So the answer is going to be C, anti-Smith antibody. All right, so let's talk about why it's not the other ones. So A, anti-centromere antibodies, as we discussed before, this is most commonly used in diagnosis of limited systemic sclerosis subtype, aka Crest syndrome. B, anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies, that's used for diagnosis of celiac disease. And then finally, um, anti-cyclic sutrilinated peptide antibody or anti-CCP, it's most commonly used for diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And while it can be elevated in lupus, it is in no way the best lab test listed here. The best lab to order out of these four is by far 
the anti-Smith antibodies. Um, Anti-Smith antibodies as well as anti-double-stranded DNA are the most specific lab tests you can use for lupus. So those are the two you really need to remember for lupus. I used to remember that the word lupus sounds like the name Lou and piss. So like taking a piss in the name Lou. So Lou piss. So I used to remember a guy named Lou taking a piss on his Smith & Wesson double barrel shotgun. Anytime I saw the word lupus, I just created a visual of Lou taking a piss on his Smith & Wesson double barrel shotgun. It's a weird visual, but that's why you won't forget it. So Smith & Wesson helped me remember the anti-Smith antibodies and double barrel shotgun helping me remember the anti-double stranded DNA antibodies. So remember when you see lupus, I want you to think of Lou taking a piss on a Smith & Wesson double barrel shotgun. Create that visual in your head and you'll remember the two main specific labs you need to know for lupus, anti-Smith and anti-double-stranded DNA. <clears throat> a three-year-old boy presents to the office accompanied by his mother with reports of acute right elbow pain and limited use of the right upper extremity. The mother states this all started after she witnessed his older brother swinging the boy by his arms as they were playing. The mother denies any other witness trauma to the elbow. On physical exam, no bony tenderness, bruising, deformity, or swelling is found. Radiographs are negative for fracture. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be a radial head subluxation, AKA a nurse made elbow. So this one's pretty straightforward. We have a young child under five is typically the age you're looking for with some sort of pulling injury to the elbow. When this happens in young children, the annular ligament is not thick or strong to resist the traction and a portion of the annular ligament slips over the head of the radius and slides into the radiohumeral joint and it gets stuck there until it's reduced. So you always want to make sure to do a very good physical exam of these children to make sure there's no signs of a fracture. They shouldn't have any uh, focal bony tenderness, bruising, deformity. And while in the vignette, I added in a negative x-ray finding just to help solidify the answer. In real life, if everything is normal in the physical exam and they fit the classic picture, for radial head subluxation, x-rays are generally not indicated. A 51-year-old female presents to the office today complaining of muscle weakness. She describes difficulty combing her hair and rising from a chair. On physical exam, you note a rash around the eyes, violaceous papules over the dorsal aspect of both hands, as well as erythema across the shoulders, upper back, and upper chest. Labs are drawn which show an elevated creatine kinase level, as well as positive anti-Me2 antibodies. What treatment should be initiated in this patient for the suspected diagnosis? So the treatment is going to be glucocorticoids. So this patient has dermatomyositis. She has Gotron papules, heliotrope rash, decreased muscle strength, the shawl sign, plus an elevated CK and anti-Me2 antibodies. It's about as clear cut as you can get. And we know for dermatomyositis, glucocorticoids are the cornerstone of your initial therapy. This is usually prednisone at a dose of one milligram per kilogram per day. Um, now, dermatomyositis has a, a few very high yield findings. And the way that I used to remember all the high yield stuff for dermatomyositis was by instead of remembering dermatomyositis, I remembered it as permatomyositis. All you do is replace the D with a P. Now you have perm, P-E-R-M, permatomyositis. Why perm? <clears throat> because when you think of this disease, I want you to think of a lady getting a perm sitting in the chair. Her hair is in the perm helmet thing. She's getting the work. She's getting her nails done, her eyebrows waxed, and she's got that cape or shawl over her shoulders as you normally wear in a salon or barbershop. And she's just relaxing and having some me time. Me time spelled with an M-I. Um, so that's the visual you need to create. Lady in a chair, getting her hair permed, getting her nails done, eyebrows waxed with a caper shawl that you wear in the salon, having some me time. Now, how does that help you remember what you need to know? Well, she's getting her eyebrows waxed and that helps you remember the heliotrope rash that's common around the eyes, the upper eyelids especially. She's getting her fingernails done. That helps you remember the Gotron papules that are most common on the top of the fingers. And she's wearing that caper shawl, which helps you remember the shawl sign or photo distributed poikiloderma, which is most common in the upper back, neck, and upper chest, exactly where the cape is distributed that you wear anytime you have your hair done. And then remember, she's having some me time, spelled M-I, and that helps you remember the anti-me2 antibodies, which are highly specific for dermatomyositis. So remember, change the D to a P and you have permatomyositis, lady getting a perm, having some me time, eyebrows waxed, getting her nails done, and wearing a cape. Question 12, 52-year-old man presents to the emergency department complaining of severe pain in his first metatarsophalangeal joint. Uh, he denies trauma to the area and states it started suddenly. Arthrocentesis is performed, which displays negatively biopharyngeal needle-shaped crystals. Patient has a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and current medications include hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, glipizide, and rosuvastatin. Which medication that the patient is currently taking is the most likely culprit leading to his current clinical manifestations? 
Give you a second to think about that. So that is going to be hydrochlorothiazide. All right, so this is about as clear-cut a case of gout as you can get. Severe pain, first toe, negatively biopharyngeal needle-shaped crystals on arthrocentesis. So you just have to remember which meds can cause gout flares. And in this case, it's hydrochlorothiazide. So remember, thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide increase urate reabsorption at the proximal renal tubule, which can elevate uric acid levels and precipitate gout flares. So they're one of the many meds that can cause gout flares. So how do you remember the main meds that cause gout? So you remember, if you put too much seafood on your plate, you'll get gout. And then plate, P-L-A-T-E, stands for pyrazinamide, loop diuretics, aspirin, thiazides, like hydrochlorothiazide, and then ethambutol. And that helps you remember the main meds that can lead to gout flares. A 72-year-old female presents to the office today for a routine checkup. Past medical history includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She states that she has concerns about osteoporosis as her mother was diagnosed with it in her 60s and wound up with a hip fracture. A DEXA scan is ordered, which reveals a T-score of negative 2.6. It is decided that the patient will be started on the first-line medication class for osteoporosis. What important instructions need to be provided to the patient about the proper way to take the medication before she takes her first dose? So first you have to remember what's the first line med, and then what's very important about administration of this med, and that's to avoid recumbency for at least 30 minutes, and then take with six to eight ounces of water. So first you need to know the first line medication for osteoporosis, that of course is bisphosphonates, and one of the most important adverse drug reactions from bisphosphonates that you have to know is esophagitis. This can be avoided by making sure that the patient stays upright for at least 30 minutes after taking the medication and taking it with at least six to eight ounces of water. It's actually a contraindication listed on all bisphosphonates to give this to a patient who can't remain upright for at least 30 minutes. It's also important for them to remain NPO 30 minutes after the dose, so no other food or meds for 30 minutes. But by far the most important thing to know that they will test you on is avoiding recumbency for at least 30 minutes to avoid esophagitis. Question 14, 27 year old male presents to the office with pain and swelling of his left knee. He was playing soccer with friends and as he was running, he stopped short to change directions and felt a pop in his left knee followed by pain and swelling. A Lachman test is performed, which demonstrates increased anterior translation of the tibia with no distinct endpoint. What type of injury did this patient likely sustain? So that is going to be an anterior cruciate ligament injury. So first, the history, a pop in the knee followed by immediate swelling. That swelling, that hemarthrosis, is a very common presentation for ACL tear. Up to 77% of patients with acute hemarthrosis after injury of the knee will have an ACL tear. And then you have the positive Lachman test, which we know is the most sensitive test for an ACL tear. And you can remember that the Lachman test is the most sensitive test for ACL tears because the first three letters of Lachman are ACL rearranged. So in this patient, all signs point to an AC tear. 14-year-old boy presents to the office accompanied by his mother, complaining of right knee and thigh pain. He denies trauma to the area. He describes the pain as severe and deep in his leg, and he often finds the pain keeps him up at night. His mother states he has no medical conditions, is not currently taking any prescription medications, and denies any other symptoms such as fever or weight loss. On physical exam, a tender, soft tissue mass is palpated on the distal femur. X-rays reveal a soft tissue mass in a radial or sunburst pattern. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? It's a little bit of a tough one, but that's an osteosarcoma. So why an osteosarcoma? Well, in real life, you'll need a biopsy, of course, to say for sure. But for the sake of an exam question, there's a few areas that point to an osteosarcoma. So first, osteosarcoma is the most common primary malignancy of bone in children and young adults. So that's definitely helpful, but not enough, of course. So the second clue is the location of the mass, distal femur, which is the most common site of an osteosarcoma in children, 32% of all patients. And then finally, the sunburst pattern to the mass. While this can be seen in other bone malignancies like um, Ewing sarcoma, it's most common in an osteosarcoma. And then Ewing sarcoma will um, more often be described as having an onion skin or moth-eaten appearance on x-ray. And uh, Ewing sarcoma very often has systemic symptoms like fever, malaise, etc., which is generally absent in osteosarcoma as we see in this patient. So in this case, the most likely diagnosis is osteosarcoma. Um, and then again, this is what the sunburst pattern looks like on x-ray. Which of the following drugs have been associated with a high risk of causing drug-induced lupus? So A, procainamide, B, metformin, C, azithromycin, D, gabapentin, or E, alprazolam. So I'll give you a sec to think about that. It is going to be A, <clears throat> procainamide. 
So there's a bunch of drugs that can cause lupus, close to 50 that we know of. But the main ones you need to know are procainamide and hydralazine. Those two alone cause around 30% of all the cases of drug-induced lupus. And then there's a few other high-yield ones that often get tested on that I would definitely remember. I used to remember the mnemonic CHIPS, as in C-H-I-P-P-S. Um, uh, so the letters in drug-induced lupus are D-I-L, as in dill. And that makes me always think of like dill potato chips or dill pickle chips, however you want to remember it. Um, when you see drug-induced lupus, D-I-L, dill, think of dill chips, C-H-I-P-P-S, and you'll know the high-yield meds that are always tested on. These are the only ones I remembered, and I got all the questions right that I was ever asked. So CHIPS stands for carbamazepine, hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, penicillamine, and sulfasalazine. Know those, and you'll very likely get the question right. Again, that's literally all I remember of the exam, and I got all the questions right that I was ever asked about. A 32-year-old male with a seizure disorder complains of acute left shoulder pain after sustaining a seizure earlier this morning. On physical exam, the patient holds the arm in adduction and internal rotation and is unable to externally rotate the affected arm. Radiographs are obtained, which reveal a circular appearance of the humeral head with a light bulb appearance. What type of shoulder injury did this patient likely sustain? So that is going to be a posterior shoulder dislocation. So with a posterior shoulder dislocation, you're looking for a few things in the question. One, the mechanism of injury, generally any kind of trauma or blow to the anterior portion of the shoulder with the arm adducted and internally rotated can cause a posterior dislocation. But what's unique and very high yield about this kind of location is that they are common after a seizure or electrocution due to the violent muscle contractions that take place during these type of injuries. So you definitely have to know that. Seizure, electric shock, super high yield for the exam. Then on physical exam, the patient with the posterior dislocation will generally hold the arm in adduction and internal rotation, generally unable to externally rotate. And then finally on x-ray, be familiar with the light bulb sign for posterior dislocations because of the internal rotation of the arm, the tuberosity is no longer project laterally, which results in a circular appearance of the humeral head and supposedly, uh, supposedly it looks like a light bulb. So no adduction and internal rotation, know the mechanism of injury, shock or seizure, and know the light bulb sign on x-ray. To remember those high yield things, I want you to visualize a uh, warning on a poster board. Now on the poster board, there's a picture of a broken light bulb and a finger and a guy being shocked. And it says, if you remember, uh, if you add your finger to a broken light bulb, you'll get shocked. So add and into helps you remember adducted and internal rotation is the most common presentation. Broken light bulb, because remember the light bulb sign on x-ray, and shocked, because remember the unique mechanism of injury, electric shock and seizure. And this is all on a poster board, because poster board helps remember posterior dislocation. So remember, if you add your finger into a broken light bulb, you'll get shocked. 67-year-old female presents to the office complaining of persistent pain in her hands and knees for several months. She describes the pain as being worse in the evening with stiffness in the morning that only lasts for a few minutes. On physical exam, there is a bony deformity and enlargement noted on the distal interphalangeal joints. The joints are hard and enlarged, but not warm to the touch. Given the patient's likely diagnosis, what is the name for the enlargement of the distal interphalangeal joints seen in this patient? So what are those enlarged things at the DIP joints. Those are known as Heberden nodes. So this patient likely has osteoarthritis, persistent pain in the hands and knees, pain that's worse in the evening, and stiffness in the morning that only lasts for a few minutes. Remember, inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis is morning stiffness for sustained periods of time, generally over 60 minutes. Um, osteoarthritis if morning stiffness is present, usually only lasts a few minutes at most. Um, we can also see the joints are hard and enlarged unlike rheumatoid arthritis, which usually has warm and boggy joints. So this is a classic presentation for osteoarthritis, and the bony enlargement of the distal interphalangeal joints we see in this patient are known as Heberden nodes, and these are considered a clinical marker for generalized osteoarthritis, and we can see what that looks like here. A 53-year-old woman with a history of diabetes and hypothyroidism presents to the office complaining of shoulder pain and stiffness over the span of the past few months. She denies trauma to the shoulder and states the symptoms have increased in severity over the past few weeks. Physical exam reveals significant limitation in both active and passive range of motion in all planes of the affected shoulder. Rotator cuff strength is normal and radiographs of the shoulder display no abnormalities. What is the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be adhesive capsulitis 
aka frozen shoulder. So why is this adhesive capsulitis and not some subacromial pathology like rotator cuff tendinopathy, impingement syndrome? Um, well, a few reasons. One, when you uh, have rotator cuff tendinopathy and impingement syndrome, usually they're going to mention in the vignette a history of heavy lifting, repetitive movements related to their job or sports, which is not included in this patient's history. I also mentioned in the vignette the patient has normal rotator cuff strength, which is another clue. And then finally, which is really important, this patient has weakness in both active and passive range of motion. Painful subacromial conditions will generally demonstrate weakness with active range of motion, but will have normal passive range of motion. And then, of course, this patient fits the classic description, which is a female in the fifth or sixth decade of life with a history of diabetes and or thyroid disorder. This patient checks all of those boxes, and that is why this is adhesive capsulitis. 49-year-old female with a recent diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis presents to the office today. She says she was started on naproxen two months ago after being diagnosed, but the pain is becoming more severe and the medication is no longer working as well. Which additional medication would be the best option to add to a regimen to slow progression and prevent further erosion of the joints. A, diclofenac, uh, B, prednisone, C, zoledronic acid, D, infliximab, or E, methotrexate. <clears throat> Give you a second. That is going to be E, methotrexate. So let's first talk about why it's not the other option. So first, diclofenac, it's just another NSAID like naproxen that she's already taking. So no value there, plus NSAIDs have no impact on disease progression. Uh, next, prednisone. Prednisone can be used for symptomatic relief, and it even has some disease-modifying effect, but is not the best option on this list by a long shot. Next, solodronic acid. That's an easy one. It's not. Um, that's not the answer because it's a bisphosphonate. Um, next, infliximab. So this is a TNF inhibitor, and it is used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but it is not first line. It's generally used as an adjunct agent in patients not getting to therapeutic goals with the first line med, and the first line med is methotrexate. So methotrexate is a DMAR, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. And while there are other drugs in this class, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, methotrexate is the most commonly used DMARD and first line for RA because compared to the other meds, it has a faster onset of action, greater efficacy, better long-term tolerance. So if there's one drug to know for rheumatoid arthritis, that definitely is going to be methotrexate. An injury to which nerve common in humeral shaft fractures can lead to weakness and extension of the wrist, i.e. wrist drop and fingers. So that is going to be the radial nerve. Um, because the way the radial nerves wraps around the humerus and travels down the arm, the radial nerve is susceptible to injury when a patient suffers a humeral shaft fracture and is the most common neurological complication of humeral shaft fractures. Um, so classically, you'll hear it being described as wrist drop, but when this nerve is injured, the patient can have paresthesias of the dorsal hand, weakness of the wrist and finger extension. And this injury um, <clears throat> actually occurs in around 11% of all mid-shaft humeral fractures. So when you hear wrist drop, be thinking of a radial nerve injury. A 58-year-old male presents to the office to seek treatment for his recurrent episodes of gout. He's not currently taking any urate-lowering medications and has treated previous acute attacks with naproxen he has at home. Labs are drawn, which reveal an elevation in serum urate levels and a 24-hour urinary uric acid secretion of 230 milligrams. Normal is going to be 250 to 750 milligrams over 24 hours. Which of the following medications would increase the excretion of uric acid in the urine for this patient? A, endomethacin, B, hydroxychloroquine, C, probenicid, D, febuxostat, or E, allopurinol. <clears throat> so the answer is going to be C, probenicid. So there's a lot of words in this vignette, but all it's asking you is which one of these medications make you pee out more uric acid. That medication is probenicid, which is a uricosuric drug, and it can be used in patients with renal uh, under-excretion of uric acid, as we see in this patient. The other meds, starting with endomethacin, which is just an NSAID used for acute attacks, hydroxychloroquine, which is not used in the treatment of gout, it's primarily for lupus, um, and then finally we have febuxostat and allopurinol, which are both xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which work by decreasing uric acid production. So the only medication on the list that increases your, uh, urinary uric acid secretion is going to be probenicid. 22-year-old male presents to the office complaining of chronic right-sided hip and thigh pain for the past six months. He reports the pain is worse at night. He does not recall any injuries to the leg. He states when he takes ibuprofen, the pain is almost completely eliminated for a short period of time. X-rays reveal a small round lucency with a sclerotic margin on the proximal femur that is later diagnosed as an osteoid osteoma. What is likely being secreted from this benign tumor that is leading to the pain the boy is experiencing? 
So that is going to be prostaglandins. So osteoid osteoma, there's really two high yield things you need to know about this benign bone tumor. One, this tumor produces high levels of prostaglandins. And the second thing is that this type of tumor responds extremely well to NSAIDs. Within a matter of minutes, the pain will be relieved, which will be mentioned in the vignette. And this will help you differentiate from other types of bone tumors like osteoblastoma, which has minimal pain relief with NSAIDs, but can present in a very similar way. That's what's going to differentiate, differentiate these two on a vignette. So remember that. Osteoid, osteoma, dramatic pain relief with NSAIDs. Osteoblastoma, minimal pain relief. So why do NSAIDs work so dramatically at reducing the pain? Well, if you remember back to pharmacology, you remember NSAIDs block the production of prostaglandins through the inhibition of cyclooxygenase. So for osteoid osteoma, remember again, two things. One, they crank out a bunch of prostaglandins. And two, for this reason, the pain ex uh, experience responds extremely well to NSAIDs. The way that I used to remember that, <clears throat> osteoid osteoma, the letters OO, Whenever I would see those two O's in osteoid osteoma, I used to remember the song that was that said, oh, oh, it's magic, <laughs> uh, NSAIDs. So it's completely ridiculous, but it made it stick for me. And then I always think of that song whenever I see osteoid osteoma. So I think, oh, oh, it's magic, NSAIDs, because of how well uh, the NSAIDs work at improving the pain from the increase in prostaglandins. All right, so now that you've heard me sing, um, let's quickly move on to this question. Question 24, scoliosis is defined as an abnormal lateral curvature of the spine with a cob angle of greater than blank degrees. So that is going to be over 10 degrees. So cob angle is the most widely used measurement for quantifying spinal curvature and scoliosis, which is calculated using plane radiographs you should definitely know that lateral spinal curvature with a cob angle over 10 degrees defines scoliosis. And then the only other number you might want to know uh, or have in the back of your head is a cob angle of anywhere from 40 to 50 degrees uh, or greater is usually where surgical intervention is indicated. Moving on to question 25, halfway there. 59-year-old female presents to the office today complaining of right shoulder pain after a fall from her bike earlier in the day. Shoulder radiographs are performed, which reveal an anterior dislocation of the right shoulder. She also complains of numbness and tingling in the lateral part of the shoulder. Physical exam reveals deltoid muscle weakness. Which nerve was likely injured in this patient? Give you a second to think about that. So that is going to be the axillary nerve. So the axillary nerve is the nerve most often injured with shoulder dislocations. And approximately 42% of patients with anterior shoulder dislocations will have some degree of axillary nerve dysfunction. The nerve runs around the surgical neck of the humerus. And this is important. Um, it innervates the deltoid muscle and the skin overlying the lateral shoulder. And that's why this patient is complaining of numbness and tingling in the lateral part of the shoulder, which is also known as the shoulder badge distribution, and is also pre uh, presenting with uh, deltoid muscle weakness as the axillary nerve innervates these regions. So it's a very typical presentation for someone who's sustained an anterior shoulder dislocation. So remember, axillary nerve injury is common in um, shoulder dislocations, especially anterior shoulder dislocations. So with anterior shoulder dislocations, there's a bunch of high yield associations. There's bank art lesions, axillary nervous function. Um, so how can you remember all of them for the exam? So you remember it all by remembering a guy named Antonio. So Antonio is this guy who's holding a picture in one hand um, and an ax in the other hand. The picture that he's holding is a bank on top of a hill, and he's holding both the picture and the ax up out by his side. So his arms are abducted and externally rotated. So Antonio helps you remember this is an anterior dislocation. The picture he's holding with a bank on top of a hill helps you remember bank art lesions and hill sac lesions, which are often caused by anterior dislocations. And then the ax he's holding in his other hand helps you remember um, axillary nerve injury is the most common is no, most common in anterior dislocations. And then finally, the position of his arms holding these things abducted and externally rotated helps remember both the way the arm is usually positioned during the physical exam, that's the way the patient will hold it, and then during the injury too. So remember, a guy named Antonio holding a picture of a bank on top of a hill in one hand, holding an ax in the other, both arms abducted and externally rotated. And that's all you'll need to know for anterior dislocations. 32-year-old uh, mother of a six-week-old newborn complains of recurrent radial sided wrist pain that is exacerbated by thumb and wrist movement. She denies trauma to the area. On physical exam, tenderness is noted over the radial styloid at the first dorsal compartment and flexion of the thumb across the palm with ulnar deviation of the wrist results in pain over the radial styloid area. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be D. Corvain tendinopathy. So why D. Corvain tendinopathy? First, we have a 32 year old postpartum female this fits the most common demographic perfectly 
as it's most common in women 30 to 50 years old, especially four to six weeks after delivery in the postpartum period. Next, we have the pain in the radial side of the wrist, exacerbated by thumb and wrist movement. This makes sense as the tendons involved in decor vein are the EPV and APL tendons, which are responsible for movement of the thumb. And most importantly, she has a positive Finkelstein test, which is pain over the radial styloid with ulnar deviation of the wrist with the thumb flexed across the palm. So that is classic decor vein tendinopathy. In case you need a way to remember the tendons involved in, uh, in decor vein, because um, I did get a, an exam question on this, the tendons involved are the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis, which is the APL and EPB tendons. So just remembering the abbreviation should be enough to get it right on a multiple choice question. So I used to remember apples um, as an APL with extra peanut butter as an EPB are delicious. Delicious as in decor vein. So apples with extra peanut butter are delicious. Apples, APL tendon, extra peanut butter, EPB tendon are delicious. Decor vein tendinopathy. That was enough for me to get it right on an exam question. 62-year-old male presents to the office complaining of severe pain in his first toe. I think we know where we're going with this. <laughs> he denies trauma to the area. Arthrocentesis reveals negatively biopharyngeal needle-shaped crystals. And the diagnosis of gout is established. Past medical history includes type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, and end-stage renal disease. Which class of medication would be most appropriate to treat this patient's acute gout flare? So really think hard about this, and that would be <clears throat> glucocorticoids. So what you have to think about first is what are the first-line meds to treat uh, uh, acute gout flare. So really there's only three. It's NSAIDs, steroids, and colchicine. So we know NSAIDs are out of the question because I mentioned this patient has end-stage renal disease. Colchicine, while it can be used in mild kidney disease when the GFR is above 30, end-stage renal disease, you really have to use other agents. So you're not going to use colchicine in this patient because he has end-stage renal disease. So in this patient, the most appropriate effective class of medication would be your glucocorticoids, your steroids, because they're safe and mild all the way to severe renal disease and extremely effective in treating gout flares. A distal radius fracture that involves dorsal displacement of the distal radius fragment is known as what type of fracture? So that is going to be a Collies fracture. So there's two different types of distal radius fractures you should be familiar with, Collies and Smith. Collies involves dorsal displacement of the distal radius. So um, let me just put on my pointer here. So Collies, you see the dorsal radius, um, the, I'm sorry, the uh, distal radius here has dorsal displacement in the Collies fracture. And then you can see in a Smith fracture, it involves palmar or volar displacement of the distal radius. So you can see it's going down here. Um, the way that I used to remember Collies is associated with dorsal displacement is by remembering um, Collie, it's a breed of dog, and it was the type of dog that uh, Lassie was, the Collie dog. So when you think of a Collie's fracture, I want you to think of a Collie dog, and the first two letters in dog are the first two letters in dorsal, D-O. And this helps you remember that a Collie fracture are dorsally angulated radius fractures, and by method of exclusion, Smith fracture is the opposite which is a volar angulated distal radius fracture. So when you see collie fracture, think of a collie dog that'll help you remember it's dorsally angulated. A uh, 47 year old male with a history of intravenous drug use presents to the emergency department complaining of progressive lower back pain and worsening gait instability over the last two weeks. On physical exam, he has point tenderness in the lumbar region, weakness in bilateral lower extremities, diminished sensation to light touch and a temperature of 103.2 Fahrenheit, 39.5 degrees Celsius. Laboratory studies reveal leukocytosis as well as an elevation in erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. Radiographs of the lumbar spine are unremarkable. MRI reveals a ring enhancing lesion at L2 to L4. Which bacterial pathogen would most likely be isolated in this patient? So a little bit tricky, but that is going to be Staph aureus. So first, what does this patient likely have? He likely has a spinal epidural abscess. Well, was the reason for that? Well, you have an IV drug user with a triad of fever, back pain, and neurologic deficits. So right away, spinal abscess should be high on your list of differentials. Next, we have an elevation in white blood cells, as well as an elevated ESR and CRP. Around 60% of patients with a spinal abscess will have leukocytosis, and almost all cases of spinal epidural abscess will have an elevation in ESR and CRP. Usually radiographs will be normal, and MRI, which is the key, will reveal an enhancing epidural mass, often described as a ring-enhancing lesion. You definitely need to know that term. And then that's the confirmation right there. We have a spinal epidural abscess, and then the leading bacterial pathogen which causes spinal epidural abscess is Staph aureus, 
in around 63, 63% of cases. 57-year-old male uh, reports right shoulder pain after sustaining a fall at work two weeks ago. He states he is unable to lift his arm above his head without significant pain and finds he is unable to sleep on the affected side at night. On physical exam with the patient's affected arm completely internally rotated, thumb pointing down, elbow extended at 90 degrees of abduction, pain and weakness is experienced when the clinician attempts to adduct the arm while the patient resists. MRI confirms a full thickness tear of a tendon in the rotator cuff, which tendon of the rotator cuff is likely affected in this patient. So think about that for a second. That is going to be the supraspinatus. So why? Well, let's start um, <clears throat> with the fact that a majority of rotator cuff lesions begin as partial tears of the supraspinatus tendon. So it's already the most common tendon to be affected. So we have that working for us, but then the physical exam findings are what seal the deal. So we have a patient um, that's performing the empty can test, also known as the Job test, which we can take a look at here. This test is generally considered the gold standard for evaluating uh, supraspinatus function because the position of the arm isolates the supraspinatus, making it the primary muscle opposing that downward motion of the arm that we're applying. So arm completely internally rotated, thumb pointing down, elbow extended. The clinician is going to depress the arm while the patient resists. And then pain and weakness is indicative of a partial or complete uh, supraspinatus tendon tear. So remember, if you see the empty can test or Job test being performed, this is to assess the supraspinatus. 41-year-old female has symptoms consistent with rheumatoid arthritis and labs are drawn to assist in making the diagnosis. The physician assistant informs the patient that a rheumatoid factor as well as a very specific antibody for rheumatoid arthritis are both elevated. Which antibody specific to rheumatoid arthritis is likely elevated in this patient? So that is going to be the anticyclic citrullinated peptide also known as the anti-CCP for a good reason. <laughs> so your anti-CCP antibodies are very specific to rheumatoid arthritis, usually over 90% specific for the disease. So if they ask you for the most specific test for RA, generally this is going to be your anti-CCP. Um, and compare this to rheumatoid factor, which has a relatively poor specificity since they're found positive in healthy individuals and up to 30% of patients with lupus. So most specific test again for rheumatoid arthritis is going to be your anti-CCP. If you can't remember, on an exam, which is the specific antibody for RA. Um, specific is spelled with two C's, so you just make sure you look for the antibody with two C's in it, the anti-CCP. 63-year-old male presents to the office today complaining of diarrhea and abdominal cramping for the past few days. He denies any recent dietary changes, no recent travel, and states the only change in his life was that he was recently diagnosed with gout and started on a new medication. Which medication did this patient likely start on for the treatment of gout? So that is going to be colchicine. So colchicine is absolutely notorious for causing GI problems, especially diarrhea. So much so that on Hippocrates, it actually says in the comments, diarrhea will likely precede pain relief, which I thought was funny. So definitely know this is an adverse drug reaction for colchicine. It's an exam favorite for some reason. I definitely remember getting a question about it in school. So just remember that. Sure. 33, a 14 year old boy presents to the office complaining of anterior knee pain. He states the pain is most severe when he plays basketball or squats down. On exam, you note a pronounced tender tibial tubercle. What is the mainstay of treatment for the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be conservative, NSAIDs, ICE, etc. So this is osgood schlatter disease. We have a 14-year-old boy, fits the demographics already as osgood schlatter is most common in males, 9 to 14 years of age, especially those who have gone, undergone a rapid growth spurt. Uh, pain is usually exacerbated by squatting, jumping, running, etc., which is common in sports during basketball, as uh, we see in this patient. Um, and then on exam, the pronounced tender tibial tubercle seals the deal. As we know, this is an injury caused by repetitive strain and chronic avulsion of the um, apophysis of the tibial tubercle, um, as we can see here. So the mainstay of treatment for Osgood-Schlatter disease is conservative, which is NSAIDs, etc. cetera, ice. Um, surgical repair is, is pretty rare. Um, and then the, what I used to remember is instead of Osgood-Schlatter disease, I used to remember osgood squatter Denise. Um, because this helps you remember it's exacerbated by activity like squatting. And then Denise helps you remember this is an issue with the knees. 43-year-old female presents to the office complaining of numbness and tingling in her hands, mostly affecting the thumb, index, middle finger, and part of the ring finger. She states it is worse at night, sometimes waking her from sleep. Uh, both a Tenel and Phelan test are positive on physical exam. This patient is likely experiencing compression of which nerve? 
It's definitely one you got to know. That's going to be the median nerve. So this patient is experiencing carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a compression of the median nerve. Um, we know this because we have a patient with paresthesias in the median nerve territory, which will be the first three fingers and radial half of the fourth. Um, in addition, she states it's worse at night, which is very common for carpal tunnel. Finally, we have a positive Tinel and Phelan test, which seal the deal. Uh, so we know this is carpal tunnel, which is median nerve compression. And just a quick tip, the two, maneuver, the two maneuvers that are listed in this, this, this vignette for carpal tunnel, the Tinel test and the Phelan test, they're often tested on, so it's good to know what they involve. So the Tinel test is just percussing or tapping over the median nerve to see if pain or paresthesia is reproduced in the median nerve innervated fingers. So you just remember the T in Tinel stood for tapping. And then the Phelan test, you just basically flop your hands over and put the dorsal surfaces or the back sides of the hands together for about a minute. Positive test is pain or paresthesia in the median nerve innervated fingers. Um, I used to remember that the word phalen sounds like fallen. Uh, and I used to remember this test is where the hands kind of like, it looks like they've fallen or flopped over because that's what it looks like when you perform the test. So just remember that the hands have phalen or fallen over. That helps you remember, you know, the way the test is performed. 67 year old male presents to the office today complaining of persistent elbow pain. He does not recall any trauma to the elbow, but the pain he's experiencing in his elbow is affecting his golf game as he is an avid golfer. An exam pain is elicited by performing wrist flexion against resistance. Tenderness would likely be felt over which part of the elbow in this patient. So I'll give you a sec. That is going to be the medial uh, epicondyle. So we have a classic case of medial epicondylitis, aka golfer's elbow. We have a 67-year-old male, avid golfer with elbow pain, no preceding trauma. And the key is that the pain is reproduced on exam with the wrist being flexed against resistance. So in this case, the patient would likely have pain in the medial epicondyle, medial epicondyle, as the medial epicondyle is the bony origin for the wrist flexors, which is affected in this condition. Uh, the way that I used to remember the high yield stuff about medial epicondylitis, aka golfer's elbow, was by remembering the sentence, mini golf is fun. So the M in mini golf, and the M in mini helps you remember that this is me the medial epicondyle involved in golfer's elbow. Golf obviously helps you remember this is golfer's elbow in common in golfers. And then the F in fun helps you remember this involves flexion. So whether it's pain with wrist flexion against resistance on exam, the fact that it involves the flexor carpi radialis, or the fact that it's caused from repetitive flexion, mini golf is fun, M for medial epicondyle, golf for golfer's elbow, F for flexion slash flexor. Uh, question 36. Which test is performed as part of the physical exam in a suspected Achilles tendon rupture that involves squeezing the gastrocnemius muscle and watching for plantar flexion of the foot? So this is a nice and easy one. That's going to be the Thompson test. So Thompson test, nice and simple. You squeeze the calf, look to see if the foot plantar flexes. If not, this is a positive test indicating a likely Achilles tendon rupture. 31-year-old male was playing football with his friends when one of his friends landed on the lateral aspect of his right knee in an attempt to tackle him. <clears throat> he immediately felt a tearing sensation, which was followed by severe pain. A valgus stress test is performed, which displays pain and laxity at approximately 30 degrees of flexion. What structure of the knee did this patient likely injure? So that is going to be the medial collateral ligament. So we have a patient with lateral trauma to the knee and a positive valgus stress test. The MCL will be the most common structure to be injured in this setting. So medial collateral ligament injuries have a positive valgus stress test. Lateral collateral ligament injuries have a positive varus stress test. It's easy to get those mixed up. So this is how I used to remember them. And then you so to associate your MCL injuries with valgus stress. Um, so valgus has the word gus in it. So whenever I see valgus, I think of mucho gusto. The M in mucho gusto helps me remember this is a test of the MCL ligament. And then varus test for LCL injuries has the word rust in it. This makes me think of rust as in the sentence leaky pipes rust. And then the L in leaky helps me remember varus test involves the LCL. So remember mucho gusto for valgus test to help you remember it's associated with MCL and leaky pipes rust for varus test to help you remember it's associated with LCL injuries. Question 38, a 56 year old female presents to the office complaining of persistent heel pain that is worse when first getting out of bed in the morning. She states it improves as the day goes on and stretching in the morning seems to help. She denies trauma to the area. Uh, radiographs are negative and on physical exam point tenderness is noted over the medial tubercle of the calcaneus. What is the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be plantar fasciitis. 
This is a pretty easy one. Anytime you have a patient complaining of heel pain that's worse in the morning when they first get out of bed or worse after periods of inactivity, especially with point tenderness right at the insertion tight site of the plantar fascia, which is the medial tubercle of the calcaneus, obviously plantar fasciitis should be high on the list of differentials. Treatment is generally just going to be with conservative uh, treatment for these patients, rest, NSAIDs, better shoes, etc. 67-year-old female presents to the office four months after fracturing her left hand. The hand was properly splinted at the time of injury, and recent radiographs reveal a well-healed fracture without any indication of malunion. She presents to the office due to new symptoms in the left hand. She notes that the hand appears to perspire profusely compared to the right side, along with noting severe pain to even the slightest touch. Physical exam demonstrates hyperesthesia and weakness in the affected hand. Increased hair growth and brittle nails are also noted compared to the unaffected side. What is the most likely diagnosis in the patient? I'll give you a sec because this one's a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> so that is going to be complex regional pain syndrome. So anytime you see a patient that had an injury and in the vignette, they go out of their way to say it healed properly, it was treated properly, etc. And yet the patient is still in excruciating pain months later. Always have complex regional pain syndrome at the top of your list of differentials. So with complex regional pain syndrome, the treatment, diagnostic tests, they're all pretty low yield. The highest yield thing to know about it is this bizarre combination of clinical manifestations. So the way that I used to remember the, con the common clinical manifestations that you'll see in a vignette for complex regional pain syndrome is by, instead of remembering complex regional pain syndrome, remember uh, complex regional pain syndrome instead of complex regional pain syndrome. So what does pain stand for? The P stands for perspiration. This is due to the autonomic dysfunction. 40% of patients will experience increased sweating. The A stands for after injury um, because this will most commonly take place after some sort of bone or soft tissue injury. So look for some sort of injury mentioned in the vignette weeks or months prior. The I stands for inappropriate pain. Um, it's out of proportion to the initial injury. Pain is typically the most prominent and debilitating symptom of CRPS. So remember, I stands for inappropriate pain. It's not appropriate to have 10 out of 10 pain in your hand from a fracture you had four months ago that is healed. So I for inappropriate pain. N stands for <clears throat> nail changes. Remember your trophic changes. So these patients can have both increased um, or decreased nail growth. They may have brittle nails. Also look for changes in hair growth as well. And then the T stands for temperature changes. So relating back again to the autonomic change that these patients can have. Um, and some patients will see a difference in skin temperature on the affected versus the unaffected side of one or more degrees Celsius. 14 year old male presents to the office complaining of right thigh pain and swelling that has persisted for several weeks after he bumped his leg at school. He also reveals he's had trouble sleeping at night because he often feels hot and sweaty. On exam, tenderness and warmth is felt on the lateral aspect of his right thigh. Radiographs are negative for fracture, but reveal a permeative or moth-eaten appearance of the proximal femur, as well as a periosteal reaction with layers of reactive bone that resemble layers of an onion skin. <clears throat> Biopsy is obtained, which shows sheets of uniform small round blue cells and cytogenetic testing reveals a chromosomal translocation of 1122 what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient so there's a lot of words going on there but make sure you just pick out your keys and that's going to lead you to ewing sarcoma so young male minor trauma to the leg leading to localized pain and swelling that's not improving he has constitutional symptoms fever night sweats all very typical of ewing sarcoma but then we have our keywords or numbers so moth onion blue 11 and 22. <clears throat> so out of all the words in that vignette and there are a lot those are your keys to choosing the right answer so the x-ray findings that moth eaten appearance and the onion skin appearance while they can be seen in other conditions for the sake of a vignette, it will very likely be Ewing sarcoma, as this is a common finding on x-ray. Um, then we have the translocation between chromosome 11 and 22, as well as the small round blue cells on histology. Those all just solidify the diagnosis. And here's how I used to remember most of those keywords. When I would see Ewing sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, I would think of another famous person with that name, which is Patrick Ewing. <clears throat> um, and Ewing sarcoma, would help me remember Patrick Ewing. And Patrick Ewing was a famous basketball player. He wore the number 33, played for the New York Knicks. Now, how does this help? Well, first, Patrick Ewing was number 33. And 11 plus 22 equals 33. And that helps you remember the 11-22 translocation. Second, the famous New York Knicks basketball jersey, as we can see here, was almost all blue with just a little touch of orange. Um, and that helps you remember 
the blue cells that are seen on histology. And then finally, I just used to remember Patrick Ewing likes to eat onion rings and just visualized him chowing down on some onion rings. And that helped me remember the onion skin appearance on x-ray. So whenever I see Ewing sarcoma, I visualize this ridiculous picture of Patrick Ewing wearing his blue jersey with the number 33 on it, eating some onion rings. And I remembered all that I needed to know for Ewing sarcoma. A 46-year-old male who suffered from a fall from his roof earlier in the day has just completed a series of x-rays. The x-rays reveal a number of fractures as well as a dislocation of the right tibial femoral, aka knee joint. What is the, <clears throat> which is the most dangerous potential complication that can arise following a tibial femoral dislocation that needs to be considered in this patient? So that is going to be a popliteal artery injury. This is the most dangerous complication following a tib uh, tibial femoral dislocation. Delaying diagnosis and repair can lead to amputation. So you need to make sure after you reduce the dislocation, you assess the distal popliteal pulses, measure, uh, measure ankle brachial index, et cetera, to ensure there's no signs of vascular compromise. What is the most common ligament to injure in an ankle sprain? Nice and quick question here. That is going to be the anterior talofibular ligament, aka the ATF ligament. Um, I used to remember that by remembering the letters in uh, ATF, ligaments stand for always tears first because this is the ligament in the ankle most likely to tear in an ankle sprain. Question 43, a 17-year-old male presents to the ER after sustaining an injury to his right arm. After x-rays are complete, the attending physician informs him the x-ray revealed a proximal ulnar fracture accompanied by a radial head dislocation. This type of injury is also known as what type of fracture? Give me a minute to think about that one because it's a little complicated. So that is going to be a Montesia fracture. So there's two types of fractures slash dislocations you need to know for the forearm. Uh, first one, as we saw in this vignette, is a Montesia fracture, which is a proximal ulnar fracture accompanied by a radial head dislocation. And then the second type is known as a Galeazzi fracture, which is a radial mid-shaft fracture with dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. <clears throat> And while it's a dislocation or instability of the radial ulnar, radial ulnar joint, it's most common that the ulna gets dorsally displaced, which is going to be important in a second. All right, so those are kind of complicated to remember. So the way that you can remember them, this isn't my mnemonic, but it's a really good one, so you definitely want to share it, um, is by remembering the um, <clears throat> sentence, remembering the, the words, gruesome murder. So gruesome murder helps you remember which bone is fractured and secondly, which is dislocated. So first three letters of gruesome, G-R-U, the G stands for galeazzi, the R stands for radius fracture, and then the U stands for ulnar dislocation. And then murder, first three letters are M-U-R, M stands for montesia, U stands for ulnar fracture, and then R stands for radial head dislocation. So again, remember gruesome murder, first three letters of gruesome help you remember galeazzi, radius fracture, ulnar dislocation, aka radial ulnar joint dislocation to be specific. And then the first three letters of murder, M-U-R, help you remember matesia, ulnar fracture, and radial head dislocation. 26-year-old female presents to the office complaining of fatigue, joint pain, and a low-grade fever for the past few weeks. She also reports that she develops a painful burn after being in the sun just for a short period of time. On physical exam, you note a rash that is distributed over the cheeks and nose, sparing the nasolabial folds, as well as diffuse discoid lesions. What would be the best initial test to order in this patient? So first think about what the diagnosis is, and then what's the first screening test you want to order? It's going to be your anti-nuclear antibody, your ANA. So in this patient, Systemic lupus erythematosus should be at the top of your list of differentials. Anytime you have a young female of childbearing age with, a, with joint pain, rash, and fever, always consider lupus. On exam, she has the classic malar butterfly rash that spares the nasolabial folds, as well as the discoid lesions, <clears throat> and she describes a photosensitive rash that burn after a short period of time in the sun. So the best initial or screening test in a patient you suspect may have lupus is your ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies. It's not a specific test, but very sensitive, and this is where you'll always start when screening for lupus, and then you proceed to your more specific antibodies, your anti-double-stranded DNA, and your anti-Smith. 27-year-old male presents to the ER after a bicycle accident he had earlier on in the day. He states his bike hit a pothole, which sent him flying off his bike, landing on his outstretched hands. He is now complaining of pain along the radial side of the wrist, uh, right wrist, and is tender just proximal to the base of the thumb at the anatomic snuff box. A fracture of which bone should be suspected in his patient until proven otherwise. So that is definitely a scaphoid. So this is a simple one, scaphoid or navicular fracture. You have a patient who had a fall onto an outstretched hand, which is often the mechanism of injury for scaphoid fracture. He has pain on the radial side of the wrist. 
And then he has snuff box tenderness done. That is a scaphoid pr- fracture until proven otherwise. As soon as you hear snuff box tenderness, always be thinking of a scaphoid fracture. 47 year old female presents to the office complaining of dry mouth and dry eyes for several months. She has used over the counter um, eye drops with minimal improvement. Physical exam reveals dry mucous membranes and swollen parotid glands. You explain to the patient you'll be performing a test to assess for tear production. What is the name of the test that will be performed? So that is going to be the Shermer test. So this patient very likely has Sjogren's syndrome. Of course, we would need to do uh, some labs, your anti-Rho, anti-Law, ANA. But she has all the classic clinical manifestations, dry eyes, dry mouth, parotid gland enlargement. Um, <clears throat> and the test that we perform to assess for tear production is one called the Shermer test. Now, with Sjogren's syndrome, in addition to the Shermer test, there's also two really high-yield things to know, and that's your anti ro and anti-law antibodies. Those are used in diagnosing this condition. And the way that I used to remember those three high-yield things is by instead of remembering Sjogren's syndrome, I would remember slow-green syndrome. So slow-green instead of Sjogren. And what's slow and green? A frog. And that helped me remember a slow green frog landed in my cup of sherbet. Um, so create that visual in your head. You have a cup of sherbet, that little frozen treat, um, and then a frog landed right in it. So show green is now slow green. Slow green frog landed in your cup of sherbet. Frog, second two letters are RO, helps you remember anti row. Landed, first two letters are LA, helps you remember anti la. And sherbet helps you remember the Shermer test. So that worked for me. Just remember slow green instead of show green. And remember that slow green frog landing in your cup of sherbet. 27 year old male presents to the office with right knee pain after a sports related injury a few days prior. He was running and felt a sudden pop in his knee. In the past few days, he has found the knee is often locking up, making it difficult to fully extend. On physical exam, you note joint line tenderness in the right knee, as well as a palpable click and pain when performing the McMurray test. What type of injury did this patient likely sustain? So that is going to be a meniscal tear. All right, so what are the keys here that tell us this is a meniscal injury and not some other type? First, the pop and lock of the knee. It's common for a patient with a meniscal injury to complain of a pop, lock, and drop. So the knee popping, locking where they can't fully extend the knee, and then sometimes the knee giving out where they just drop because the knee just gave way. Um, And then finally, the physical exam findings are key. So first, the joint line tenderness is a very sensitive physical exam finding, but it's very nonspecific. Um, And then the McMurray test, which seals the deal, which is a painful pop or click in the knee uh, with repeated passive flexion and extension. And if you ever forget that the McMurray test is associated with meniscal injuries, um, so Murray is obviously a man's name and meniscal, when broken down, has the words men is call. So men is call. Remember, men is called. And what are men called? Murray, as in the McMurray test. So if you uh, see an exam test with the name Murray in it, remember, that's a man's name. And it's what men are called, as in men is call. So that'll hopefully help you remember the McMurray test is used in uh, meniscal tears or help to diagnose meniscal tears. <clears throat> Question 48. 22-year-old male presents to the office today complaining of swelling in his right upper arm that has increased in size over the past year. He states the area is not painful. Radiographs are obtained, which reveal a large pedunculated lesion that is pointing away from the joint space. Biopsy is obtained, and the physician informs the patient that the swelling they have in their arm is caused from the most common type of benign bone tumor. What type of benign bone tumor does this patient likely have? So that is going to be an osteochondroma. So osteochondromas are the most common benign bony tumor, accounting for 30% of all benign bone tumors. Um, Usually these types of tumors tumors are seen in the second decade of life, more common in males than females. And often, although not always, the mass is going to be described as painless. And then on radiograph, look for them to describe the mass as being pointed away from the joint space. And then sometimes the lesions can be described as being pedunculated, which um, we see in this patient, which just means that the cap is larger than the base. Think of a mushroom, narrow stock, big cap. Um, But be aware, lesions can also be sessile, which means the base is larger than the cap. 29-year-old female presents to the office complaining of anterior knee pain. She denies history of trauma to the knee. She's an avid runner and has a marathon coming up in the next few weeks and is hoping for some improvement before the event. On physical exam, lateral movement of the patella results in discomfort and apprehension from the patient. What common disorder of the knee is this patient likely suffering from? So that is going to be patellofemoral syndrome. So when you get this question on an exam, it's always going to look the same. Female runner or cyclist with knee pain, no trauma. The only thing you really need to decide is one thing. 
Is this patellofemoral syndrome or is this iliotibial band syndrome? It's very simple. If it's anterior knee pain, it's patellofemoral syndrome. If it's lateral pain, it's iliotibial band syndrome. Easiest way to remember this is just to think about the anatomy involved. Maybe you can't remember where your iliotibial band is, but I'm sure all of us know where our patella is, our kneecap, anterior side of the knee. So if it's a female runner with anterior knee pain, it's patellofemoral syndrome, as in the case um, in our patient in the vignette. She also has a positive apprehension sign, which is where you have the patient flex the knee slightly, apply some lateral pressure to the patella, and if they kind of squirm around and attempt to straighten the knee, that's a positive test. That's an apprehension in their case, um, an apprehension test. And if you can't remember that the patellofemoral syndrome is most common among female runners, just remember it like I did instead of remembering patellofemoral syndrome, instead remember it as patellofemale run syndrome. So instead of patellofemoral syndrome, Patello female run syndrome, as those are the key things to remember about this condition, because that will be in the video. Blank fractures are the most common carpal bone fracture. So that is going to be scaphoid fractures. I figured I'd end this on a very easy one. That was a very long, a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of stuff in there. Um, so scaphoid fractures are the most common carpal bone to fracture. As we wish went over a few minutes ago on question 45, make sure to look out for snuff box tenderness in these types of fractures. All right, so that is it. If you made it all the way to the end, I am very impressed. Um, hopefully that helped. Um, thank you as always so much for watching the video and for the support and good luck in PA school, your pants, your pantry, your EORs. Um, and thank you again for watching the video.